All right, thanks for joining. We're gonna kick off our first quarter uh, Q&A. So we have a couple things that came in from uh, investors this quarter. We're gonna to touch base on those. We're gonna go over some of the strategy things we are working on. And then uh, at, at any point, if you have a question or you, you wanna go into more detail on something, if you use the uh, chat feature at the bottom of the screen on Zoom here, it'll show up and we can answer any, any kind of questions uh, that you have on either a specific deal or what we're seeing or strategy or any of that kind of stuff. So, okay. Sounds great. Yep. Okay. So first thing we want to talk about, and this is something it's been in a lot of our reports going forwards and we're, we have a standard formula of what we're using, making deal decisions. Uh, but when we look at our taxes and insurance, so really over the past 10 years, we've seen a fairly steady increase in revenue, either through rental rates or occupancy trends. So that's been fairly sta standard and steady over 10 years. Uh, what hasn't really been has been taxes. And for a while, taxes were pretty low, either on a per unit basis or a per square foot basis, uh, or really any metric you wanted to look at. And over the past three years, we've seen a rapid acceleration in tax and insurance rates. Uh, I think that's been in the, the media plenty as well, especially if you look at some states that are that are becoming very expensive on that front. Uh, but what essentially we're seeing happen is the trend of our taxes and insurance cost as either a percentage of revenue or our total cost of our operating expenses becomes significantly higher. So in the first quarter of 2024, we have our on average, so this is there's some that are much higher and some that are lower. But on average, taxes and insurance are about 25% of our total expense burden. So you add up everything we're doing, 25% of it is taxes and insurance. If we look at it from a per revenue standard, 15% uh, of our revenue goes to paying taxes and insurance. That's specifically property taxes and property insurance. What happens is one, it just becomes too expensive and the margins aren't there, we're seeing margin compression on those deals. And as that gets higher and higher, we're just going to simply exit those deals. We don't, there's not a good way we can combat higher taxes or higher insurance rates. We appeal everything on an annual basis. That's normally our go-to, uh, but as tax rates become higher and higher and higher and our margin compression ex keeps happening, uh, it's no longer a deal that, that we can hold. Um, the main one we're looking at right now is our Kingstown deal on the east side of Atlanta, where uh, taxes are taxes and insurance are almost forty percent of our revenue that comes in the door. Right, and that's that's up. You know, so you look at a property like Kingstown or some other ones. You know, when we bought these properties, taxes were running three to five hundred dollars per unit per year, and now Kingstown is pushing twenty five hundred dollars, twenty seven hundred, twenty seven hundred per unit per year. So that's 5X in give or take a five-year hold. It's, it's pretty aggressive. And if you're looking at it as far as taxes, how many months of rent you need to pay taxes, you've gone from one month to about three months now. Is that yeah. accurate? Yep. Yeah. And we've touched base on that before. So all of the stuff coming up when we talk about, are we going to exit a deal? It's going to be around uh, our margin. And if it's not there because taxes and insurance are too high, we'll look to exit. So that's the that's the immediate one we have right now that we are listed and working with a, a broker there to exit that deal. And it's really specifically around that. That is the reason we're we're making that decision. Uh, and those will continue on assets as we uh as we see that happen. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, next uh part, it's it's part question, part uh part just decision points coming up. But if you recall back in 2017, we had the tax cut in jobs act that happened and it, it had a good amount of impact in the real estate market as a whole. Um, but it, it, I mean, it really affected all aspects of taxes that were being paid both business and personal wise affected depreciation, affected deductions, all that kind of stuff. So that comes up in 2026. So however, kind of this presidential election goes this year, we're going to see, I, I it's going to be hard not to see a change. Right. Something's going to happen in 2026, and there's going to be a pretty big impact to taxes as a whole. When we look at things that directly impact us uh, on the operator side, a big one was the bonus depreciation and the ability to expense, you know, not, not taking depreciation and spreading out over seven or 10 years, you could expense it right away. 
prior to that, to do that, you had to, for the most part, use cost segregation in real estate. And now you, you don't have to do that as much. That's not an, as an active thing. It's not something we've done in a while on them. So right. cost segregation would basically take a building and divide out the windows, the appliances, mechanicals, and then give a different depreciation schedule to each one of those things individually. So we don't, we don't do that right now in our assets. That might change based on how this election goes and then how, what do you call it? They, they changed that act. So you're saying like that yeah, act so, just expires. Yeah. So it expires at the end of 2025. And I, I, there could be an option where they, nothing gets done. Right. If there's, if there's not agreement and it basically reverts back to 2017 tax code. Yeah. yeah so uh, if nothing gets done, it just reverts back. There, there is so much money on the table really for both sides, Democrat, Republican, and our individual voting people that uh, we think, so, you know, I think everyone's uh, in agreement that something will get done because of the yeah. impact is so huge. Yeah. Just some, just some quick points on it. It's uh, almost every individual tax bracket would see a, a slight increase in the taxes that they're paying. Um, estate gift limits go back to the 2016 or 17 number. So it's roughly 22 million now for a married couple or, or 12 million individually or 11 yeah, and a half. Think, yeah. And those come down to like the 7 million individual 14 as a, as a married couple. So, you know, all those kind of get compressed, the state and local tax limits that you could put in for deductions. There were caps on those that were added. There were limits on mortgage interest deductions and, and, equity home equity line of credit deductions that were eliminated. So there's going to be a lot of changes that happen. So that's going to be something that, and there could be new things that we don't even know about that could change going into 2026 that affect the real estate and the sponsors uh, entities uh, like ourselves. Yeah. So the, the discussion that we were listening to yesterday was more as you're looking at who you're voting for in the fall, whether it's president, whether it's your congressperson, whoever it is, they're going to be contributing to this, this updated tax code. Um, and think and to consider that along with all the other considerations. Yeah, because that's going to be that's going to take place. It'd be one of the first. It has to happen. Things in 2025 they start working on probably. Yeah, and then down to the wire. <laughs> I assume <laughs> till the night before. <laughs> till the night before. Yes. Okay. Um, another question uh, that, ha that we had come in and, and going through kind of this and how it affects deals is what are we seeing in the credit markets. And for us, that means what are we seeing in the debt in lending environment? And we could apply that to a couple of different asset classes as we look. Uh, I think easiest if we start with the net lease. Yeah. So, so net lease, I mean, net lease is still, they're still lending. Uh, interest mm -hmm. rates aren't great. So I think last time we checked, it was about seven plus or minus a little bit, but we could yeah. find debt on triple net deals with high credit tenants and with longer leases, short leases, they'll, uh, you know, we, we usually try to get a longer lease at closing. So uh, bottom line is we have options with a, a triple net uh, properties and double net properties, as long as there's a tenant behind it that is meaningful. Uh, I would say that probably like a mom and pop tenant for retail would be a little bit harder right now. Uh, possible, but a little bit harder, uh, especially when there's a lease in place. So that lease makes a big difference. So ideally, when you're doing a retail lease, uh, a retail property, retail purchase, you want to make sure there's a lease in place, a good tenant and some longevity yeah. to the actual lease. And if if you have all three of those, I mean, the lenders are still there. Interest rate's not great, but the lending is yeah. there right now. But it's there. But it's there, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's, that's not the case when we look at some of our other deals. Right now, anything that needs like CapEx work or TI dollars or improvements done to it, the lending is, I mean, I would say not yeah. there. Yeah, few and far between. Right. Well, specifically, if you if you're talking about improvement dollars, really the, is the tenant improvements to get lease. So you have a vacant building, even if you have a lease, that basically guarantees that someone's going to be moving in and paying rent, but we have to spend, say, a million dollars to improve it. Uh, lenders are not willing to reach out and say, hey, we'll give you some leverage to help out with that build out. They're saying you got to come out of pocket for that. We are, you know, you either already have a loan in place or we're only going to fund the purchase of the building. Yeah. So that's, uh, it's a, I mean, a lot of the deals we look at from the value add standpoint uh, do have situations like that. And there's not a lot of lending appetite out there right now for that construction, for that TI, for that renovation dollars. It's also even on a deal, there's not a lot of new client or new bank relationships that we're seeing happening. We talked to our bankers. 
and it's it's kind of hard if they're saying, hey, we're going to have a, a fully brand new customer come in and do a loan with them. That's, that's a little tighter right now. So not happening as much. If you're an existing customer of a bank, we have lots of banks we've done deals with over 15 years. And, and for that existing relationships, you can get deals done, but it's hard on the new relationship side. That's what we're seeing. And also most of our activity right now is through credit unions. That's what we're seeing more appetite uh, for doing the lending. Right. And then on the multifamily side, you know, you still have Fannie and Freddie that are putting money out. They've, they have dropped their spreads quite a bit. The spreads really, really at the, at the peak of spreads, they were around 225 to 250 basis points. They're now down to about half that. So multifamily lending, you could still get for around five and a half percent fixed for 10 years, which is pretty good. And so spread, spread means the, the rate that you're going to interest rate that you're going to pay versus what you're going to see kind of like printed in a newspaper. Right. Right. So that spread 250 basis points would be two and a half percent higher. So if it's posted as four, you're going to pay six and a half when spreads are the highest. And those have now come down. Right. right. Yep. Fannie, Fannie and Freddie, I mean, they're, they're adjusting that based on, you know, supply they want to, yeah, they, I mean, supply and demand, but they, I mean, they want to support multifamily housing. It's a big part of their thing and supporting affordable housing. So they're going to, they're going to price that stuff so that deals can transact. So that's a good indicator of like kind of where the market's at. And, w- and when we go with one of our loans, um, I, I think at the end, we were talking about Park Hill earlier that at the end of next year, our, our Park Hill loan renews. When we go to Park Hill and we show that our rents are still in the affordable range and there's metrics that we have to show, we get credit, we get credited discounts against our, our rate to subsidize our loan, which yeah. is great. And there's no restrictions on it. There's no requirements on it. It's more that we are acting as an affordable housing provider so we get discounts for that. Yep. So if we look at uh, debt maturity, we kind of take the credit markets, it ties into our debt maturity. And we have not had many loans that come due in 2024 and, and very few that came in 2023. That was intentional. All the way going back the past five, seven years, we've been trying to sign fixed rate debt to avoid floating rates, to have longer terms, everything, just a longer term outlook. Now, 2025 is when we start seeing uh, loans that are going to mature and they're going to come due on the apartment side as well. So we have we have Park Hill, like Josh, you just mentioned there. That one's coming due uh, in 2025. This really starts in the third quarter of 2025. And then Amberwood Apartments, that was deal number eight. It was a long time ago now. Strong. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so that deal we've had for quite a while and we have a, a 10-year loan that's coming due yep. in 2025. And then Roswell Pediatrics, the 1830 VA complex, those deals also coming due at the end of 2025. And we have interest rates in these deals that are in the 3% range. Um, I think they're going to be higher is my yes. crystal ball. Arguably yeah. maybe double. Yeah. But uh, So uh, that's going to happen in 2025. It's not a crystal ball anymore. It's actually fact. So I, It can't be a crystal ball once when it's like the time and your prediction are <laughs> at the same point, right? That's just uh, where it is. Yeah. Uh, so obviously higher interest rates reduce cash flow. So very aware of that in, in working what we can do. Um, the loans we're going to have on these assets, there'll be, there'll be lower balances than when we first started simply because we've paid off a good, good amount of principal on these over the years. So there'll be some... Uh, re-amortization of that. And, and even if we have a higher interest rate, we, we could have a similar payment with how much debt we have paid off over the years. So that's the part we look at. You know, Amberwood, we've had, again, it's our eighth deal. We've had it for 12 years at this point, maybe. And, and Park Hill, I mean, that was our 22nd deal. So we've owned these deals quite a while. Uh, we're deal 120-ish now. So we've had them for a while. Want to go into specific properties? Yep. So, okay. First question we had, and and this is also a long term deal, is our Saddle Creek deal. But we had some questions on Saddle Creek, and essentially, what does this time horizon look like, where the rent restrictions wear off? And, and we and this is deal number twenty. Twenty three. Twenty three. We bought it in twenty sixteen. 2015 um we bought it from two guys that built it in 1997 it had 
they they took just about every government dollar they can in exchange for yeah, they, they were a tax credit developer so yes. they're going in and doing that yep exactly. and and they sold it to us for a discount because of the how heavy the restrictions were and now those restrictions are expiring at the end of next year and we can go up to market and what's interesting is that this is the only affordable property in five mile radius 10 in mile a, radius yeah in, in a large area yeah and it's the only rent restricted one that's out there and when these wear off we'll be able to bring them to what the market rents are in the area right. now what we can't do is is just wholesale kick people out wholesale just you know jack everyone's rents up that's just not how we operate as a business um, so we're going to keep trying to maintain our 70 percent retention we'll have to put money into the units if we're going to get higher rents we we firmly believe that tenants and residents really only have one just one factor they're looking at right they can look at the price that they're going to pay right and if our service and quality doesn't match up with the price that we're charging tenants are going to leave uh, so we got to make sure that uh, the rates we are charging are are acceptable and kind of in line with their expectations so we we want to maintain over 70 percent retention we do not want to see a ton of move outs and really hurting our cash flow or really hurting our occupancy levels because we do have a loan here through 2029. We have pieces of that loan that we have to maintain. We have to maintain our occupancy there, right? So it's uh we have to maintain our debt coverage ratios and that stuff. We can't just um, drive the vacancy down and miss on those covenants. We don't want to do that. And it's also, we want to have 70% retention uh, and really look at incremental revenue growth there uh, as those units do come to market when we brought the property seven eight years ago the it was freshly renovated new kitchens new bathrooms everything was i mean it was very basic but it was all new now that we're coming up on that horizon we're really looking at kind of not only in order to achieve those higher rents but also just maintain the property is that we need to start turning the units again turning the kitchens and bathrooms again and um I, currently we're restricted to around give or take 1100 dollars a month is that about correct right? Yep. And and the markets on the low end of the market is around seventeen hundred. Is that what we've seen? The median yep. is probably closer to two thousand a month. So you know our our target we're probably not going to get to the median. We'll probably get below you know close to that seventeen hundred range. But we'll have to upfit the units. Yeah, and ten years. If you look at a deal, ten twelve years is that's going to be on average. Even with us, that's a that's about three different uh, residents that go through that. If you have an average you know, lease term of around three years, which is very good, but that's still three whole users that are going through there and cabinets and everything. They, they takes a toll on the, on the apartment there. So it's going to be time mm -hmm. for some heavier turns. And that, that even includes mechanicals. Our HVAC systems, if, if they last 15 years, that's very good. It's a very good run. It is Especially not the new modern ones. Like it, we had some 40 year old dinosaurs that used to run forever, but, uh, that was when they used to make things somewhere back the, else. Back in the good old days. Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> the right, good old right. days. Yeah, yeah, the 40 year old AC would it's, just go forever. But in the 1900s. Yeah. Now, <laughs> back in the 1900s. Yeah, now we're seeing, you know, if you're going to get 15 years of an HVAC system, that's pretty darn good. Yeah. By the way, I just have to say my, the air conditioner in my house is actually from the 1980s and still wow. working. Yeah. And I, impressive. I can't. Yeah. Am I supposed to replace it? And, <laughs> well, it's probably more efficient. Yeah. Yeah. However, Yes, it still works. <laughs> if that was one built in like 2010, it would be broken by now. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So, so that's what we're seeing on on, on Saddle Creek. I mean, this is gonna, uh, you know, be a continual discussion, especially as we get into really the end of 2025 and going into 2026 of what that looks like. And just to give some ideas, this is this is a property that uh, has federal rent restrictions because the federal government is putting out what the really the income levels are and what the rents can be. Uh, it's a website called HUD user that has all that information. And that's really what guides the um, rental rates at a property. Over the past five years, the federally posted rental rates have gone up 37%, but the taxes, the property taxes specifically have gone up 57%. So that's where we kind of see this deviation of hey, uh, eventually that, that tax increase really takes a toll on, on where things are, are at. So we have to see a revenue increase just to cover, flat out just to cover the taxes that are being paid. So we're seeing that here too. Okay, we're gonna move on to the next question. Also, also property related, we're kind of into the property related question area now, but Henderson Mill, and there were some questions on how the valuation uh, looks on that asset. 
people noted it's very well occupied, yet the valuation went down. So how does that happen? Uh, so two things going on there. One is how we calculate valuations. And two is uh, the quarterly swings that occur on a property. So Henderson Mill specifically, we're doing a elevator modernization program there, which is a fancy way of saying we're spending a lot of money to fix old elevators. Uh, required by state law and federal law. I don't know if it's federal, but it's like, no, it's, it's, it's basically state. the, yeah. yeah, I mean. You're being required to do it is what you're saying. Yes. Yeah. So the elevators, uh, you know, they don't have so much of a useful life. We, we knew this going in. We have reserves to do it, but we're still spending big chunks of money to go do this program. Uh, it's going to be, and again, this is a, this is a five-story building. This is one of our very our taller buildings. Towers. Towers for us. Yeah. I think it was five stories. <laughs> yeah, tower. It's tower. Great. Five great. story tower. Yeah. Uh, but it's going to be almost $500,000 to go through this program. So it's a, it's a significant cost. And if you own an elevator company, congratulations. Uh, <laughs> it, it has our deposit going into it was $300,000. So this wasn't like, we talk to them, they start doing some work and progress bill us. It was a $300,000 deposit just to get the thing going. We plan to be, well, we plan to be done in the second quarter, which means, yeah, we'll hopefully we can hit that date. We are waiting on, it's really in the elevator company's hand to, to do all the work. They're building a new car, the elevator chassis part offsite, bringing it in and assembling it in the elevator shaft and replacing all of the controls and lifts and everything. So it's a big, it's a big piece of work that has to happen. Now, when we do one of those things, the cost of that, we're going to have two quarters at Henderson Mill where we have some major swings in what the what the financials of the asset look like. Even though we have reserves, even though we're prepared for doing it, it still makes the financials look uh, not great. And when we're doing our valuations, we're basing that on what does that quarter's financial performance look like? Sometimes that goes up and down fairly wildly, right? And and if we change our method of valuation too much on, on stuff, then it's just not really productive. So we're looking at really what our quarterly cash flows are and saying, hey, let's let's take kind of what the market cap rate is right now. In this case, we have a lot of medical and government users and basing it on that. So there it showed that our, our valuation went down because of this. We're pretty sure once we get through the elevator modernization and we come out in the third quarter, that's going to swing back the other direction. So, but we would have no, uh, we would not take that as a reason that, Hey, in the middle of something, doing a program like this or a renovation work where we look to sell something because of this, right? It's not, this is not like a, a tax bill increase. We're like, okay, we can't control this. This is something we knew is, know is happening. Uh, we're managing that process. It does make the financials look worse for the first quarter, and it will make it look worse for the second quarter. And then the third quarter, we should be on the other side of it. No. You want to add anything on that? Or is that no, I think it covers it. Okay. All right. Next one is Midtown. Always get lots of questions on this one. It's a very dynamic, exciting property with so many buildings. So it has a lot of moving parts. That makes sense. Yeah. We always look at deals and the, I think if you can think about it from an investment standpoint, the lower we pay, the more problems we're going to have. <laughs> That's essentially yeah. what it looks like. And this one uh, is one of the cheaper deals we've ever bought on a per square foot basis. So it was, it's very expensive as a whole. It's like $20 million, but on a per square foot basis, it was, it was very cheap. So we started this deal. Kind of some of the questions came in like, hey, how many even buildings are left in this thing? Right. How many buildings are there and what is our basis? Right. Yeah, it was very fair. It's a fair, it's a very fair question because this deal has been uh, confusing as to what's being sold. Where are we? But so let's, let's just, if we just start from the beginning, we started with 11 buildings and we have sold two of those buildings. We sold one that was called launch kitchen. It was a, 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 a kind of like a restaurant incubator. It was 19,000 square feet. We sold it for $130 square foot. Uh, the next building we sold was the Chattanooga Eye Center. We sold that. It was 10,000 square feet. We sold it for 130 square foot. All right. So now we sold two buildings. We're down to nine. Down to nine. So we currently own nine, which is 248,000 square feet. And by selling those two, we generated 3.8 million, 2.5 plus 
of cash and a hundred percent of that cash went to closing costs and paying down the loan. Yes. So n- none of it went to cash on the balance sheet. None of it was distributed to investors. That's why there's questions. Yeah. Yep. So yeah. So it's like, Hey, we made money because we bought these at a basis of $80 a square foot, but we used all of that to pay down debt. So 3.8 million of debt. Now we have another deal that's under contract right now. Uh, and this one is 24,000 square feet. So it's another, it's a big chunk. And this one is lower on the valuation of the sale. We're selling it to a, a tenant that is there. So it's $106 a square foot scheduled to close in May. And that'll, that'll free up just a, about 2.4 million, 2.5 million. 2.6 is what we're under contract for. So, cause yeah, 106 yeah. square foot. Right. So again, that will all go to paying down debt on this deal. So we'll pay down another. And, and it'll get us right to the $10 million mark of debt left on this deal which is give or take what per square foot, like $40 a square foot? A high 40s, $49 a square foot right. of debt. So our overall base is still, you know, still $80 a square foot blended, blended base of what we went in at. But now our debt keeps going down and down. Significantly, so we're down to $50 a square foot in debt. We also have another, another building that we're listing uh, where we have it listed to sell. Uh, it's not under contract. We don't have any LOIs on it right now, but, uh, we are looking at uh, selling one of the other ones. So that would take us in May, we'll be down to eight buildings. And then after this next one sells, which will probably um, end of the second quarter, beginning of the third quarter, take us down to seven buildings. And that's again, another huge chunk of debt that we're, we're paying off here. Right. And the business plan here is ocu- clean up the buildings, occupy them, sell them off once, once occupied, once we, and these ended up selling, I would say uh, probably faster than we intended because we had two tenants come forward and say they want to buy their buildings once they saw our business plan. So yeah. we're, we're, we're really ahead of pace here, which is great. Yeah. If we could sell to some more tenants, it'd be a, yeah. it'd be excellent. Mm-hmm. But so, so the deal is going well. It's just, we're using all funds to pay down, to pay down debt. And, and that, uh, that won't stop until we either refinance the deal or sell the deal entirely. Uh, the, uh, I guess the mandate from Wells Fargo is that we are not allowed to receive any cash from a transaction. It has to go to the loan. So. Well, I mean, the last transaction, which was, you know, give or take two and a half million dollars, we pay our monthly debt payment dropped by $30,000 a month. So it's definitely helping our cash flows as we continue to hold it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Next question we had was on one of our dollar generals. And that question was around understanding is it truly a net lease deal or is there stuff that we're paying? Well, dollar generals, they kind of come in two flavors right now. So we have the double net lease on dollar generals and we also have the triple net uh, uh, lease on dollar generals. We, we always prefer the triple net. Triple net basically means that everything is paid by the tenants. So taxes, insurance, all maintenance is paid by the tenants. And all we're, all we're doing is number one, making sure the tenant is paying their taxes and paying the insurance. And we're responsible for paying the mortgage and we do do yearly inspections to make sure the tenants uh, taking care of everything and there's no roof leaks that are being ignored. So we do do some supervision, but ideally, you know, we like to buy triple net deals. A lot of our dollar generals are double net deals, which basically means that they do pay the taxes and insurance. Uh, uh, but to some double net leases, we do pay the insurance and some double net leases, they pay the insurance. But for dollar general, typically they pay the insurance and then we're responsible for the roof, the parking lot. The building exterior and so like in, in one particular instance like we're responsible for the lighting on the exterior of the building for a dollar general double net lease and so typically what that means is the triple net lease is going to be first of all priced a little bit for for a higher or for a lower cap rate because it's a more valuable lease but with double net deals we always have to kind of put some expenses in there we have to say okay well when's the roof going to be need to be replaced when does the parking lot need to be restriped when does it need to be re, you know when do the potholes need to be refixed and so we have more of a capital plan with a double net lease when we uh buy a dollar general with that lease structure so does that yeah make sense the to other you? the other part is the is the tax payment oh the right? tax this is payment unique is, to dollar general oh, it's, yeah that's a fun one that's a fun one so, so yeah, I'm gonna do it. Uh, but um, the way they structure the leases that, uh, in the Dollar General leases is the, the landlord. So that's us. We're responsible for paying the taxes. So we actually write the check for the taxes every year, and then the tenant reimburses us. And the tenant, let's just say, they taste they take their time. And so typically, it's a essentially what it is. It's a free sixty to ninety day loan to Dollar General or 
family dollar or, or, or whatever the, whoever the tenant is, we essentially give them a free loan for that period of time. And, you know, they, they do pay, but sometimes it just takes them that 60 to 90 days, which means we have to float the cash. And so uh, particularly this one particular quarter, we paid the, uh, the tax bill and we were not reimbursed. And so that kind of, that affected the cash flow of the property. And so we didn't make a distribution on Dollar General Sevierville because we're just waiting for the tax payment to be reimbursed. And once that tax payment's reimbursed, we'll probably have uh, a catch up in second quarter. So the second quarter payment will be a little bit higher than, uh, than normal. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's it's not really like an issue with the tenant. It's just how they, right? I mean, if they start to they, take like you know six months to pay us back in taxes, we could technically call them in default of the lease. But yeah. I don't think we want to call a Dollar General in default of the lease. Maybe if they because they're months, still paying the rent, they're still paying the rent, yeah. and it's a lot of times it's just an administration issue where the right person didn't get the tax bill or we didn't send it to the correct location. So we need to make sure that we're doing our job by saying, "Hey, Dollar General, you need to pay this tax bill." Yeah. Okay, next one. This wasn't really a question, but everyone got their got their announcement of our technology change. We are moving away from Juniper and moving to a system called Agora. And there's a couple of reasons uh, in doing that. And ultimately, we feel like it's going to provide a better environment for uh, our investors and us to operate in. And that has a, a couple meanings on the on the back end of how it works, on on the front end presentation. Uh, to investors, and that made us to want to do that decision. I, I think it all stems in the beginning is is the system we were with before was it when we first started with Juniper. I mean, we were pretty new in their system. I mean, we were we were early on a, a adapter with them, I would say, and it was very focused on the syndicator relationship of what is that syndicator, us, the general partner. Uh, doing and how can we support their business and over the past two years there have not been really any new technology improvements on that side uh, for the on the general partner side of how do we administer how do we take out a deal how do we uh, you know when you have to sign up for something how do we have there be less clicks how do we make it more efficient how do we make the distribution process better and in the in the software world if you're not improving you're kind of getting behind and we've just felt uh, like we had not seen incremental improvements on a quarter over quarter basis that are necessary to keep pace. Agora is more uh, focused on that GP investor relationship versus being focused on uh, institutions or asset management layers, that kind of stuff. We don't have those functions and we're not looking for that uh, software offering. So we wanted to focus on the GP to investor relationship. We think Agora will provide us with uh, some better ways of doing that. Some some immediate changes uh, that you'll see as you get your email, as you register for it, is that there's a single sign-on function. And many of our investors have invested through multiple accounts, whether you have a self-directed IRA, whether you have something in a personal name and a trust name in a child's or a spouse's name, you could have multiple accounts. And with Agora, you can log in and toggle and see the, see those different accounts all with one login. On this is something we've been talking about with Juniper for a while, and with there you had to have multiple accounts and log in in different ways to see your full portfolio, and it, and it felt cumbersome. As to why we'd have to do that, so that was a big reason on purely on the investor side. If we look at on uh, on our side for the general partner, you know we when we do a distribution in the in the past, we're going in and setting up manual and, and we could save profiles and we have good bank accounts. We had to set up manual entries to do wires for distributions through every bank account. So it, you know, we have a great team here at Greenleaf, but it is, it is a manual process. It takes about a full day to do that. And anytime you're, you're typing in uh, numbers repetitively, it opens up potential for mistakes, right? Um, Agora, on the other hand, enables us to save all those prof profiles and have essentially hitting a button that enables a general partner, us or any other general partner that's using Agora to streamline that distribution process and get stuff out to investors and have it uh, protected on that, uh, on that timeline of information even better. So we're very excited about that on our end. Uh, we are committed to getting our distributions out on the 20th every month. This saves us a whole day in that process. So we've got 20 days. This saves us one of them from manual entry. So we're very excited about uh, 
what that does for, for our distribution process. And it has all the same information in there, right? All the quarterly reports are loaded up there. We have everything backloaded so everyone right. can see all their information. Has all the distributions in there. Everything yeah. from Juniper was migrated forward into Agora. So all of the old reports, all your old OMs, all your old investments are right there in your view. Yeah. Cool. So, and if, and if you have any questions, you email us at our invest at email. Uh, we can, we'd be happy to answer anything, walk you through anything with the, with the portal uh, and just go through it. So, yeah. okay. We, uh, next thing we're going to move on to just some of the new opportunities we, we have coming out, give you an idea of where we're going, uh, coming into Q2. So, yeah. You talk about some of the value add stuff we're starting with. Yeah, so um, we we kind of categorize our opportunities in four distinct categories. Value add is really a, a lot of our traditional stuff, which is buy something that's existing, uh, that is operating to some degree. Normally, a long time owner, more no, normally is just has not had a capital injection in a long time, and uh, we can come in with a fresh capital stack, um, fresh set of eyes, fresh, uh, you know business approach and improve it so we have um it's it, we, have, we have a flex opportunity coming up in norcross uh that we're excited about it's about forty thousand square feet that their average rents are what seven eight dollars a square foot the market's closer to 12 13 very similar to our pleasant dale flex property that's a both of them are 100 percent occupied but under market rents that um as leases come up we can turn them over realize market one by one and it performs very well yeah. We've done it a whole bunch of times, especially in Norcross. We've probably done what? Six, yeah, seven that one's times. been a good. That's you a know. good flex market right off of uh, 85, the main highway out, out of Atlanta. So we like that area. Yeah. Another one, uh, our deal out in Columbia. Yeah. Colum I mean, oh, so, so going to the next category is really this distress category. So we've we've been chasing a couple deals. Um, one is in Columbia, South Carolina. It's a, it's a bigger property, but it's coming directly from a lender and they really just they want to get paid off and move quickly. So um, we're, we're bidding around $30 a square foot, which would be really the cheapest property we've seen out there yet in years. And so- I remember uh, cheap and problems are kind of directly exactly. correlated, but yeah. yeah. It, it is only what- 50% occupied, give or take. It has a multi-story office building, but lots of single-story office buildings. So um, we have a unique plan that we can basically discount down the multi-story office building, get it leased up quickly, and then the single-story office buildings turn them into flex. So we're excited about those two distressed. And yeah. then we have another one that we're looking here in, in the Atlanta metro area that um, has been kind of hot and cold with the seller. So yeah. uh, we'll, we'll leave that one on the back burner for now. <laughs> and as we, as we kind of go into the next opportunities, we talk about retail. Right. So we have a couple of deals. We're always working on operator partnerships right now. So uh, market deals have pretty much disappeared for us because prices have not changed. The market uh, prices have yeah. adjusted maybe a little bit, maybe 50. It's good for stuff we own. The prices really haven't changed. Right. It just right. doesn't help us when we're trying to buy something. Right. So we can't buy stuff. If the price hasn't changed and interest rates have doubled, it just doesn't make sense anymore. To yeah, buy we stuff. want the assets we own to go up and the assets we don't own to come down. <laughs> and the assets we want to buy, we want the prices to be very discounted. Yeah. And so there, there's a little bit of a difference. <laughs> Honestly, the biggest opportunity we have right now are operator partnerships where we're helping an operator buy, buy a location, fix it up, and then rent it. And so we're looking at a couple of deals right now with uh, possibly putting like a uh, some branded retail uh, into uh, old space. So like, for example, an Ace Hardware, uh, uh, you guys could talk about grapes and grains a little bit. But, you know, if we if we take this brand that has some recognition and some some um, uh, credibility behind it and we do we put that brand into something that there was not before. It, it increases the value of it. We get a longer lease. We get a brand behind it. And then the value of the property increases from yeah. there. And that's how we're going to, you know, that's what we're focusing on right now for retail. Yeah. And all these retail opportunities or, or any kind of franchise, it's like you, you have a good franchise and then also ultimately comes down to that franchise operator. That uh, That's where we're, we're looking to make our relationships at and work with strong operators within a strong brand. Mm -hmm. That's where we see opportunity of growth going forwards. Yeah, and through that partnership, we can basically sign a long-term lease at arguably a higher cap rate, say an eight or nine cap rate. And by having that structure, number one, we're in a really good place to cash flow. But number two, we have a really great valuation when the market would probably be trade us closer to seven cap rate, but we own it at nine, we make that yeah. spread. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, the last part we want to touch base on is just debt. You know, we've, yeah. we, um, we saw this as an opportunity that was going to come out where interest rates are higher, there, there's... It's a tougher market out there on the lending side, and we have found some opportunities where we can step in and and really place a unique piece of the debt. 
right. part of it. Yeah. So we've done that. We did that in January with discount with our discount lots. Uh, we bought a 54 lots uh, throughout Texas and Georgia and uh, North Carolina and getting making a nice return on that uh working with a great operator or working with a great partner that's putting the, these together for us and we're looking at the next batch of those to go out really later this summer and then um also with this uh waller texas land de development project that uh is closing you know later this week in the in the coming hours days yes <laughs> so happening shortly here but so, so as we as we shop this idea and we meet and we meet more people in need of this that lenders are now fulfilling their the the gap in the market will look to create more opportunities uh just that's a quick question so tax implications of sales in the opportunity zone fund if if we sell something in the opportunity zone fund what are the tax implications going to be uh we did this with heritage square where we sold that deal and then we rolled that fund and used that in uh, other opportunity zone funds, and it did not trigger uh, capital gains taxes. From our understanding, if we redeploy sale proceeds in to opportunity zones, uh, we don't have a tax implication from that. Now, there's other parts that tie into that. There's a 15% basis step up that happens in 2026 that we don't have a clear answer yet on. Working on that with our our tax accounts. Many of you know Brian. Uh, to come up with like, how does that work coming into 2026 and that step up in basis? That's really the the main part that we know is coming up in 2026. But if we do sell something and we are unable to place it and we are unable to invest it in something and we're just sending that cash back, that would, that would trigger a taxable event. But before we do any of those things, we're going to obviously go through all the scenarios with uh, the tax accounting side to figure out what that looks like. But if we do things just like we did with Heritage, where we we sell it and redeploy into uh, Opportunity Zone assets, there's not taxes on that front. So, uh, so next question on the Aura analysis and the quarterly reports. It it's something we're rolling out collectively, so it'll be something we talk about more in each of our quarterly reports. And really, what that Aura is enabling us to do is. When we look at our investment returns on a property, we have many deals, like we mentioned Park Hill or Amberwood, where we don't have any original equity left in those deals. Uh, so it's hard to say, hey, what's our return on equity? It was like, well, we gave all the money back. So what we're looking at now is if we take all of our fixed assets on a property and say, well, how much cash flow or yield is being generated from that? It's like, what does that ratio look like? And as that starts declining, right, where that's going to be triggers for us to either make strategic uh, decisions on that asset. If we have a way to turn that around and uh, see margin expansion, we'll hold it. If we can't see margin expansion, we've done everything we can, we'd look to sell it at that point. Uh, but yes, we'll we'll start including that in the quarterly reports on the cover page write-ups as to the trends that we're seeing in that. So, okay, next question here is uh, an idea if the 10-year holding period is from the beginning of the fund or from the purchase of the property? I guess we're talking about if we purchase a new, a new property, but for investors, it was when they put the money into the fund. And then we had timeframes that we had to deploy it. So it was really the fund level of holding money from day one to- Year 10. Year 10. Yeah, and that was part of the reason why we did it in a fund structure was to kind of smooth out those ripples of going in and out. And that it, it gave us a lot of flexibility by buying six assets over that 10 year period and, and selling and then redeploying capital. It, it just gave us more flexibility on yeah. avoiding those taxes. Yeah. Coming All down. tied to the first date of the opportunity zone fund. Yeah. All right. Uh, next question here is how will the loan on Barnes be serviced once redevelopment begins and all current renters are moved out? It's a very good question. Uh, right now, we do not have a loan on the property. So we are working on the redevelopment plan. And when we have that and we know the full cost scope and we have construction drawings, at that point, we have to figure out how we're going to finance the opportunity. You heard us talking over the past year that there's not a lot of construction financing available out there. So uh, we're going to have to address that at that time. We don't have a full cost scope yet. We just really got the zoning approval that we could even do this. So now we're going to go through the construction design and what that looks like. 
Uh, so that'll probably take us two months to get that information together and then start taking it out to uh, to banks and lenders that uh, we've worked with, that we have a relationship with and see if there's any interest uh, to get that started. But yeah, how that loan will be serviced once we start that, it's really a construction you know, that's a, that's a full construction loan where we're going to have to have some amount of reserves that go to the lender that they're drawing on to, to pay for the debt service as we draw up the loan to pay the general contractor. Um, we'll have a full model of what all that looks like kind of as we have the construction drawings and, and get through that process though. It'll be I mean, rough, very, very roughly speaking, you know, talking about 38 townhomes and kind of general construction costs. It's roughly about a $5 million project. So that's, that, that's kind of how we're weighing it and sizing up with the local community banks and seeing what fits. Yeah. Okay. Appreciate the questions. Thank yep. you. Thank you. Thank we're going to leave it open for another minute or two here uh, and see if anything else comes in. Another question. Okay. Uh, so if we move from the current location, how will cash flow be affected at the station? Yeah. So we're looking at the forum flex uh, building as one that we could uh, move our office to. Some because we have people that are just doubled up in spots right now. On two uh, different or two and three different floors of the property. Yeah, we, we're currently using three different suites right now. Uh, so we would have to go back and then re-rent those those spaces. The problem things about rent, it, it, if it's something is not built out and not usable, it is very hard to rent. If something is built out and ready to be occupied, it has been significantly easier to rent, even in our um, suburban office stuff. We talked about our Johnson square asset and how, you know, we're in the mid 90% occupied there. The station is very well occupied for the stuff that's available to be rented. So we'd be able to take our office space, uh, and then re-rent it behind us and probably do so not as such a large, uh, template, but as a individual, uh, units. So right now, right now we have four units at the station where we have just kind of connected the hallway to let people sneak through. Um, and we use that as our space. So we could put those walls back up and then rent uh, more manageable spaces that are like 1,500 to 3,000 square feet. Uh, what is the status of the car storage facility? So we're opening that over at the forum as well. And we just got verbal approval from the zoning commission. Yeah. Uh, th so last, we, last night, the 23rd? Yeah, on the 23rd, we got, um, the, we got a 25th. text amendment that basically allowed for hobbyist clubs to exist in in the city. So um, we can, we're basically have the green light to go build it yeah. out and get it going. So we did the, can the initial drawings on that, on that uh, facility, it's almost 20,000 square feet and we're starting the construction drawing stuff now. So we'll, we'll be submitting that for permits over the next like two weeks, but overall the, the permitting and approval process is uh, it's not a quick one. So to say the least, we It'll probably take us a month and a half, two months to get through that process. And then we can start on that. Okay. okay. All right, folks, we're, we're going to call it a day here. So thanks for tuning in here. And if there's anything we didn't cover or anything else you want to see, please let us know. Thanks. Thank you guys. Thanks. Have a good day.